very much for the introduction and also thanks to the organizers for um, uh, giving me the spot after I missed uh, so the schedule, my schedule talk last uh, or two weeks ago at this conference and, and also for organizing this, this very nice I mean, uh, trimester program with a great environment so far. And uh, okay, yeah, before going to math, I, I think I have to explain all these logos to you because I already confused a lot. <laughs> yeah. so I didn't put my current affiliation. I mean, usually it's below the name. But uh, so, my, so this is uh, Heidelberg University logo because uh, this is my affiliation. I'm a postdoc funded by SPP. And okay, the trimester program is organized by him. And in the end, we are at the University of Bonn. <laughs> this is the motivation of all this logo. Okay, and uh, okay, this I will, I will talk about some uh, a recent work, kind of a recent work, uh, of course, in collaboration with Ankana, uh, in which okay, we study some energy scaling for variational models related to shear memory alloys. And then in the end, I would like to uh, connect uh, this, this work with some recent results, uh, I mean, that we, okay, we are, in which we are still working progress, we're still an ongoing project. Okay, um, background. Okay, variational models for free memory alloys. So we have to talk about magnetic phase transformations that are phase transitions observed in some okay, alloys when uh, the material is cooled down and it passes from a, oops, from a highly symmetric uh, microscopic lattice structure, which is called the oscillate phase, to a less symmetric um, lattice structure, which is called the martensite phase. And uh, due to this uh, lack of symmetry, we may have I mean, uh, several uh, energetically equivalent, if you want, um, states. And uh, this, uh, so these martensitic phase transformations are characterized by, uh, by the formation of microstructure, because with, this, um, with these different states, we can concatenate them in a compatible way in order to create microstructures, and this microstructure is usually has a, I mean, interesting uh, microscopic effect, for instance, shape memory effects, or super elasticity, and, uh, and okay. Very nice uh, notes uh, about this, more from a relational point of view, or the notes from Müller, and uh, from, if you want a more physical insight, uh, those of uh, Bhattacharya. Okay, so we want to study this variationally. So, of course, the way to go is, uh, I mean, the seminal work from or in James, in which they propose the following uh, continuous model. So omega is our reference domain, and the form domain, uh, u is our deformation, and uh, which deformation we associate uh, okay, an elastic energy that depends only on the deformation gradient. And the deformation gradient basically tells you uh, okay, the, the, the affine deformation of the lattice structure of the material, so in the finished point. Uh, and okay, this w is uh, an energy density, and uh, should satisfy, okay, as we've seen here, be, uh, not, not to worry about the generacy in the volume term, uh, we consider, I mean, I don't know, positive determinant uh, of the gradient, and uh, here uh, this uh, energy density should satisfy some, uh, some reasonable symmetry assumption. Okay, this, this, less, uh, this left uh, multiplication, so this uh, left multiplication invariance, with the group of SOM is just saying that if I take my material, I deform it and then I rotate it, of course I should have the same elastic energy. And okay, this one is, um, um, is just, um, okay, this P is called the point group and it's just taking into account this image of the material. So if you want, there are some uh, uh, change of references that uh, leaves the lattice structure of the material uh, unchanged and of course I want this to, be, to have the same elastic energy. And uh, okay, so the, the, um, the prototypical energy density uh, so is the following one. Uh, so distance of the general gradient from a set of, um, um, a set of matrices, um, K, that is usually of this form, so a multi-well uh, multi set. And these AI are just uh, the affine deformation that characterizes uh, basically uh, the the states uh, that the material wants to accommodate if uh, unconstrained. Okay. Uh, so, and of course, these uh, should have uh, minimal elastic energy, and that's why uh, 
this is the prototypical energy density. And okay, in this in this variational model, the modeling hypothesis is that again the material would like to accommodate the states of uh, of minimal energies, uh, thanks to Andre. Uh, I mean, his, uh, in his previous talk, we already uh, we already seen that this existence or of course uniqueness of minimizers is a very trivial, uh, a very non-trivial uh, business. And of course, this this energy is in general highly non-convex, is a multi-well, so we can never assume that we are I mean, a minimizer. And, uh, and, of, uh, and okay, in this picture, we say that microstructures are I mean, minimizers that exist or minimizing sequences of the elastic energy that present some fine uh, situations. Stupid question, but the energy is invariant uh, with right multiplication by SO and matrices? Uh, by the P, by this uh, a sub a sub um, group of ah oh, a sub group that are like the symmetry. I mean, this is the symmetry group of the lattice structure. So are all the rotation that lives in oh, variant. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. So um, maybe this is a bit too much if you want, but uh, just uh, an easy scalar um, model energy that shows you that we cannot assume that we have a minimizer. For instance, here we take uh, basically our stress free sets are just uh, the gradients uh, 1, 0, minus 1, 0. And here we can prove that, for instance, with 1, 0, we, we don't have, so if we have 0, we don't have minimizers, but we can achieve uh, the minimal, I mean, the infimum of the elastic energy. We have minimizing sequence, infimizing sequences, if you want, that, uh, I mean, oscillates uh, with finite and finite oscillations. Okay, so the, uh, somehow the elastic energies in general are highly degenerate also because lack of convexity also means lack of uniqueness even if we have minimizers. Okay, so we have seen that from this point of view only with elastic energy, I mean it's always better if you want to uh, have finer, finer oscillations, but uh, in real world, but in real world, uh, I mean microstructures uh, for at certain length scale. Okay, it's not they are not infinitely inf infinitely fine, uh, as we see from this wonderful experimental picture that is also probably on the poster of, uh, of the Trinity problem. So yeah, very focused uh, today on images and uh, and logos. And, uh, and okay, so in general we can we can ask. I mean, uh, since uh, okay. Um, Okay. Yeah. In general, this is a, an, an interesting question. Which of these microstructures are physically relevant? And uh, for this question, we have seen that uh, elastic energy alone is not enough. So what uh, one usually does is to regularize <coughs> the problem. So we but usually by, by adding a, a singular higher order term. So, um, um, okay, in general, some term that penalizes the oscillation of the gradient. So, for instance, we, uh, we take uh, epsilon as a small parameter, and to our elastic energy, we have this epsilon uh, surface energy. Okay, we call it uh, surface energy because basically it's just some measure of this um, of these interfaces between uh, different states. And typical uh, regularization are I don't know uh, total variation of the second derivative of u. Okay, you usually hear maybe this uh, normal L2 norm square deviation or things like that. And uh, okay, mm -hmm. it's just just to say that this penalizes uh, oscillations and in some sense works as a selection mechanism. What we do uh, when we mm, compute the minimum of this of this uh, now elastic plus surface energy or similar perturbed energy. Okay, but still. Um, okay, again in materials, again this wonderful experimental picture, you see different uh, type of, of, um, of microstructures. For instance, this is where you can say a first order microstructure, so a laminate here that um, uh, is, um, is uh, compatible with an homogeneous state here, or maybe even two laminate states, laminate uh, uh, in, a, in a higher order of laminate. Okay, and this may depend. Of course, on, on set K, so on the material, but also the same material uh, as in these two pictures are coming from the same alloy, uh, may present different structure, and this may be, um, may be uh, say, may come from the boundary conditions. 
So in general, to investigate the, the, these questions in a, in a quantitative point of view, uh, we study energy scaling behavior. So meaning, you take your uh, singularly perturbed energy, you optimize over all u, and you want to see which um, scaling of epsilon uh, has this quantity here. And uh, this can give you, I don't know, for, for instance, from an upper bound point of view, can give you some can give you some insights of the length scale at which these uh, microstructures uh, form. And from the lower bound point of view, we, uh, we can also have, I mean, one can also uh, tell something about regularity of, of microstructures, as in this uh, in this wonderful result from uh, Ankana, Jimmy Taylor, and Christian here. Uh, in which, if you have a, a lower bound, you can say something about, I mean, in general, convex, uh, convex integration solution of uh, the corresponding, uh, uh, okay, uh, the corresponding differential inclusion. But okay, so in general, uh, energy scaling behavior says something about microstructures that may appear. Okay, so now this is our, our uh, say, main goal of our, um, uh, of our work is that to study which um, interactions are between uh, the boundary conditions that, I mean, if unless specified, will always be a fine boundary conditions in this talk. Uh, um, uh, okay, so which influence has the boundary condition on the energy scaling behavior? Uh, okay, so in particular, we will see that um, um, to, to study this, we present some um, some set of some stress-free sets uh, that's uh, in which now we dropped um, so we simplify a little bit the model so we drop the gauge invariances so no son floating around but just k is just uh, um, a union of finite uh, matrices so if you want it's no longer an angle problem but an and gradient problem and uh, for for this set of matrices uh, uh, that we can provide we can show that the order of lamination completely determines uh, the energy scaling behavior. And okay, this sometimes we would call uh, sets of staircase, staircase type, uh, because I mean, the inspiration comes from this work of Conti, Farago, and Manji, uh, but uh, they are, I mean, in the end, they are differently defined. So okay, this is just uh, um, the inspiration. And okay, these are, uh, okay, these this results come from this. Or they're defined on the on the archive, uh, okay, in collaboration with Elkana. and then in the end uh, we 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 will try to uh, to apply this result uh, to the I mean connect this result to some to more work in progress in a more physically relevant uh, case. So this is geometrically linearized qubit to the triangle. Okay, so before. <coughs> Okay, before showing the, uh, you the, the main the main result, I just recall a little bit um, uh, what lamination over order of a set is, and um, so I start with the lamination convex cell. So I take k, in the, uh, I mean a set of matrices here of quadratic uh, matrices, and then the lamination convex cell is the <coughs> is the set which is um, iter um, defined iteratively in this way. So k zero is simply the set k itself, k one are called the set of first order laminate. So you take all uh, the matrices that can be obtained as rank one convex combination of the element of K. And this, of course, uh, okay, also in the previous talk, Andre commented on that. I mean, uh, if you want to laminate, you have to, your, your states have to be rank one connected I mean, for the other one, uh, jump condition. And, uh, and okay, this is K1. And then K2 is simply, you take all the rank, all the matrices that are rank one convex combination of the element of K and K1 and so on. Okay. And uh, so these are uh, the staircase uh, sets that we propose. So these are, okay, in n dimension, we have n plus one matrices. And uh, these are characterized by the fact that uh, the lamination convex cell uh, arrives up to order n. So we can have uh, at most laminates of order n. And, they, and actually, the lamination convex cell is basically one dimensional, so it consists of this union of, of segments. And here I just uh, feature the first two non-trivial sets. So here we are in 2D. Uh, ah, okay, uh, maybe this I forgot, but all, the, all our matrices are diagonals. Okay, so here we are in 2D. 
and uh, we took these three matrices and this blue line here are first order laminate and this red line here are second order laminate and then in order to to create a uh, K4, we just add one dimension and we add yet another matrix. And so this is one, two, third of the line. And then we can uh, iteratively construct this by adding each time one dimension, each time one matrix. Okay, these are not, uh, it's not that we can only deal with this, but with this we can uh, systematically uh, obtain our, uh, our result. Okay, so now uh, yet another thing to precise is that now our elastic energy is no longer um, so we, we basically decouple the bulk term and the surface energy term with this phase indicator chi, which just a BD function taking values exactly in the stress free set. And basically you can think of this chi to be the projection of the gradient onto the to the set of um, of uh, stress free matrices. Okay. So now our elastic energy is no longer, I mean, our singularly perturbed energy is no longer um, uh, depending on u, but depends on chi, because we infimize here on u, and f is just uh, an affine boundary condition. Okay. And here, uh, the surface energy is simply the total variation of, of this chi multiplied by epsilon. So we just care about the jump part of the grid. We don't care about the absolute continuous one. Okay, and then, okay, of course, uh, so maybe a comment is that then uh, we, con we consider, uh, so we infimize in chi, so infimize in chi, at least realistically you can see that this kind of recover the same nature of uh, elastic energy, singularly perturbed elastic energy that I show you before. Okay, so this is our, uh, this is our result, so we take in n dimension, we take our staircase, so our set of staircase type, and uh, if we take uh, a fine boundary condition of order m, exactly m, so not m minus 1, exactly m, then uh, you can see that the, the scaling behavior is determined by this order m. So if I take, for instance, uh, okay, actually I will comment it later, but uh, okay, depending on the color in which I pick my f, okay, I have a different uh, m here and I have a different uh, scaling behavior. Okay, now a bit of a literature just to I mean, uh, comment a little bit this result that we got. Uh, of course, uh, Konemula is the uh, is the scaling uh, the most maybe the most famous and also surprising scaling. So epsilon to third um, uh, from a, okay from a model allowing for first order laminate and similar similar results have been obtained also by Abeya Otto. This I will come back later maybe on this on this result in the cubic to tetragonal. Charing quantity for some nonlinear, uh, really nonlinear elasticity, and also for uh, more general uh, operators, also by Yankana with Camillo here um, in a recent paper. And uh, okay, so these are basically uh, epsilon to third, the to third are okay, the, the most famous scaling that you have for shape memory alloys. And uh, then we have yet another scaling uh, from Kohn and Bird. Uh, but this epsilon one half, with, which um, uh, quantifies a second order laminate, but for models that are not related to shape memory laws, but rather to compliance. And uh, I mean, this to me, uh, I don't know if uh, there are uh, higher order scaling related really to models uh, to shape memory laws. Um, and okay, then we have um, okay, our result that uh, also a previous paper uh, of mine with. Uh, Again, with Ankana, in which we quantified the tartar square. That uh, okay, it's basically it's basically aligned for infinite order of lamination, and we have you can see a very um, very rigid scaling, so which is slower than every uh, power of that sign. So somehow this um, this scaling can be. I mean, if you if you put m one uh, m equals one, so first of the lamination, we really get the Kohn-Muller scaling. If we put M2, we get the convert, so uh, what you expect to be the scaling of the second order lamination. And uh, we basically adding uh, uh, orders of lamination, we are more and more rigid. And so um, this, this scaling can be, if you want, somehow heuristically be an interpolation of the super, rigid, very rigid, I mean, almost completely rigid scaling of the Tartar square. And I mean, the less rigid one 
which allows for first order lamination of Cohen Okay. So this is the very general one in n dimensions. Now uh, all the ideas, both of the okay, but especially for the lower bound, can be uh, can be uh, said already in two D. So this now I will focus on this two D because it's better to keep track. And uh, okay, so this again is our um, stress-free set and uh, was was presented by Laurent. Um, it also obtained a very interesting result that I didn't uh, uh, put earlier, uh, but uh, this was for linear growth, so I didn't want to confuse you with exponents. And, uh, and okay, so this is our strategy set, and uh, here we have this kind of, if you want, okay, uh, determination of the energy scaling uh, from the affine boundary data. So if the affine boundary datum is blue here, so it's first order, then we have Cornula. If instead is red, so second order, then we have, if you want, <laughs> uh, uh But okay, we have the scaling of the second order. Okay. So this this one, I mean, uh, we'll not really talk about because it can be reduced really to the formula, and this is maybe the interesting one. Okay. So uh, before going, uh, so now I will try to uh, give you a little bit of the ideas of the lower bound, and then maybe a few comments on the upper bound. Uh, regarding this uh, second point. So the first idea is uh, looking at exact solutions already because it gives you some hint of the of the lower bound. Okay, we consider, I don't know, Lipschitz, uh, if you want the formulation, we have uh, the <coughs> inclusion, and then we say that uh, if the differential inclusion holds, then either uh, we are affine or we are laminate. Okay. And, uh, and then here the proof okay relies on the diagonal structure of, of the set case. So here you have diagonal component of zero. So the diagonal component depends only on one uh, variable. But if uh, kind of here you can see that each matrix is completely characterized by by its uh, second component, second diagonal component. So if it is minus one, is a two. If it is zero, one. If it is one, is a three. So this means that the full gradient. Is uh, the old gradient is just a function uh, of x2. So, in, pre in particular, the, the first uh, diagonal entry just must be constant. And uh, if it is, okay, and if it is constant one, we are affine. If it is constant minus one, we are, we are laminate. And okay, this, this I just tell you because this fact that uh, the second, uh, uh, so one diagonal entry is characterized characterize uh, the other. It's pretty crucial also in the lower bound uh, arguments. So, so now, uh, how, to get a, how to get a lower bound uh, out of uh, this, um, if you want, uh, exact uh, solution idea? We want basically to, to get um, uh, kind of something in the, in the form of a rigidity estimate. So by, by this, I mean that the, our, um, basically our, um, exact um, solution result just says that if we are a solution uh, of, the same, um, of the inclusion, then the first component is a fine. So if we want to, uh, if we want to quantify this, we can uh, I mean, write some kind of a rigidity estimate. So the, the distance of uh, the gradient of U1 from uh, a, fine, uh, um, a fine map is controlled by some energy term. Okay, and when this energy term goes to zero, means that we are the solution, so we are fine. And this we want to try to, to implement in order to have our, um, our uh, lower bound. And this we kind of implement, uh, okay, this is purely heuristic, it's just try to try to understand uh, what is going on because we work in Fourier space. It's just to uh, get, I mean, something in the direction of a chain rule in H minus one. So here, here um, I mean, here the, the, the crucial thing is that, okay, now uh, chi 1, 1 I, I passes from the gradient from okay, the projection of the gradient, if you want. So um, as we said, um, uh, we have this fact that the, the second diagonal component completely characterizes the first diagonal component by the structure of our, uh, of, of our set K. And this, okay, okay also because of uh, discreteness, because we have just three values to interpolate, we can formulate in this way that we can find a polynomial such that chi 1 equals a polynomial of chi 2. Okay. And uh, so from 
this I will be will be uh, hopefully mirror in the next slide. But from an elastic, uh, if we have very small elastic energy, we can basically control the off diagonal uh, kind of the off diagonal term of the of um, of the gradient. Uh, so we have um, so we have in particular a control of the second derivative of chi one one, but then um, in the h minus one norm. But then if we could if we could control the full uh, gradient of the first diagonal component, then I mean we know that the h minus one norm of the gradient square is just uh, the L two norm. I mean of um, of of the part. So the uh, the h minus one norm of something is the L two norm of this um, uh, of this antiderivative. If you want. Uh, okay, but how do we control the other um, the other uh, partial derivative? Okay, if we would have some chain rule in H minus one, then we could just plug in this derivative. Um, uh, so just this equation here. So the first derivative in the end reduces to the zero. So to the control of the first derivative of the uh, other diagonal component, and then we have that the full gradient is controlled, and then we have a control. This tilde zero just means something which is small up to some rescaling of uh, elastic energy. And we have that this, this term is controlled by elastic energy. And this term has the same nature, you can see, on this other term because of uh, diagonality. Okay, so this, <laughs> these are the ideas that I try to uh, show you, and I want to, so we want to uh, quantify specifically. So, to do this, we work in Fourier space. And okay, um, our reference domain, maybe I didn't comment, was, uh, was the square. So, here, we can also assume that f is simply zero, so we can uh, um, we can consider periodic uh, um, um, the periodic uh, extension of our uh, of our chi, and uh, we just um, um, we work just in Fourier series, and this is uh, I mean this is a control from below of the elastic energy that maybe just to motivate very quickly I can try to write down, uh, it's not so, so difficult to get because our elastic energy is simply the u minus chi square and then if we write down, I mean, in terms of here we have omega and if we write down in terms of uh, Fourier transform then this becomes simply something on this type here is the Fourier transform okay. and then by just, uh, by just considering uh, since, I mean, our elastic energy is simply the infimum over u, okay, of this quantity here, we just consider our Lagrange equation here, just means doing the divergence of this thing and put it equal to zero. Okay. We just can play this thing here for every k, apart from, okay, the zero term that, if you want, comes up from uh, the answer inequality here. And then we uh, you solve this okay basically this, this system and uh, you plug you plug uh, the, the minimal u uh, back here and you get this uh, this uh, elastic energy so this formulation for the elastic energy okay okay so uh, working in Fourier space we can try to uh, somehow quantify um, so quantify um, basically this, uh, this right hand side in this way. Uh, so here just uh, okay, just consider when these multipliers are, are larger than epsilon alpha, we get this, uh, this lower bound here for the elastic energy. And uh, here, okay, just working with uh, the symmetric, I mean, um, uh, with the difference quotient, we can obtain, okay, still working a little bit. Uh, this lower bound also for the surface energy. Okay. When here we have introduced this alpha, and now we can really quantify if you want. Uh, uh, so how uh, how a, a minimal uh, how a state is basically uh, misaligned okay, from from the elastic energy is misaligned from the uh, the rank one uh, from the rank one direction uh, that are the coordinate direction and. Um, if the states, I mean, 
Okay, uh, basically we can control high frequency, uh, the high frequency term of, uh, of the state sky 1 and k 2 by term of the surface energy, and we can control the misalignment of k 1 and k 2 by the elastic energy. Is what I wanted to say. Okay, and so this uh, this controls uh, from elastic and surface energy are I mean, or also uh, can can be found in the literature we in see our in our work, for instance, if you come in bottom, and this will come in bit. And okay. So uh, so now what do we do? Uh, we uh, try to check where uh, our our wannabe minimal states, so chi. Um, uh, takes their mass, I mean, concentrate their mass in Fourier space. And we want to uh, quantify the leftover uh, by, some, uh, by some control of every scale the total energy. Okay, so from this one and two here, we can basically say that uh, if we have introduced a quantification, that is this epsilon alpha, um, so the first component. Um, uh, so all the all the mass in the frequency space that is outside this red cone <coughs> is controlled by this um, elastic energy. Uh, so by this um, rescaled total energy term, and all the mass I mean of the second component outside this blue cone um, is controlled by the same term. Okay. So this means that up to this rescaled total energy term, uh, this two uh, um, okay the state minimal state concentrate their mass into these cones and now what we want to do is trying to uh, um, try to uh, use the fact that one component characterizes the other in order in order to uh, reduce the dimension of this cone and uh, to get uh, somehow um, uh, to to control this lower to control the, this this lower bound uh, from below by a positive constant, and then, and then obtain uh, so a lower bound for the for the total energy. Okay, and, and for this is kind of crucial to keep track of the dimensions of these cones in, in Fourier space. So here, yeah, just to comment here, the length of these cones is of this of this um, this term, whereas the width of these cones, since the spreading angle is epsilon alpha, is just the length multiplied by epsilon. And this will play a role. Okay, so now the main idea: how to implement, I mean, the nonlinearity, uh, so the nonlinear relation between the two components. So we here we can, for simplicity, think that okay, um, the first component is simply the second component squared. It's actually a general, uh, maybe in, in general a polynomial, but uh, who cares? I mean, just for simplicity. Okay, now in Fourier space, okay, this the square just becomes I mean um, convolution and uh, so if you think if you believe that the um, uh, the k the, the diagonal component of chi um, concentrates on these cones then uh, you believe that uh, if I take uh, the second diagonal component and I convolve with themselves that then the support will be contained basically in a stripe which is simply the Minkowski sum of this cone within itself. Okay. So since this um, since this uh, convolution term just equal k11, okay, in the end the two support should be um, uh, should be intersected. So the actually k11 will also uh, be supported in this uh, Minkowski in this Minkowski sum of this cone. And so actually we have reduced basically the dimension of the cone. So we use some, some information, so the information related um, that, that relates the two diagonal components in order to say, okay, but our first component is no longer, uh, I mean, concentrating in such a large cone, it's, concentra it's concentrating in this cone, but without changing the quantification of the energy scaling of the total energy on the right hand side. So in particular, if you want, if you want to quantify this, uh, so now the length is the order Okay, minus one plus three alpha, and uh, of course the width is over the minus one plus four alpha. Okay, now we want basically we have such a control, and now in order to get a lower a lower bound, we want this to be uh, bounded from below by a positive constant. How can we get this? So this is I mean here comes maybe uh, the the place in which 
it's really important to have um, uh, to have fine boundary conditions because in this case, basically use, using um, uh, the fundamental theorem of Karpus, we can control this low frequency term uh, by the same amount of um, of total energy here. And basically now it's just to check, uh, so to choose, I mean, a specific value of alpha for which this epsilon minus alpha correspond to this length minus one plus three alpha. Okay, and this values of alpha is, al is alpha one fourth, and for this, uh, not only uh, we have mesh uh, this epsilon minus alpha with this uh, minus one plus three alpha, but also we have that when alpha equals one fourth, the width of this cone is basically uh, border one. So apart from uh, positive, I mean, apart from multiplicative constant, we can assume that this cone is one dimension, and so we can control uh, this frequency term. And basically, um, and basically, we have a lower bound because we start from the distance of the first diagonal component from um, from f one, uh, which is the affine boundary datum. But if you remember, this is our set f one. We can also uh, f we can also consider to be zero, and uh, chi one one is taking values in plus and minus one. So with a fixed affine boundary datum, this will also be. And then this left hand side will also be a positive uh, controlled by from below by a positive constant. And these are all the things that we have said before. And uh, we actually have a control from above uh, of this type of this type when alpha equals one fourth. Uh, okay, so this may be okay, not really super important that uh, we don't have such a clean uh, such a clean um, uh, result because uh, here we have also to take into account, um, I mean, where um, the, the diagonal component also are not concentrated, but okay. So we don't have a super clean uh, upper bound, I mean, um, I mean, control in the elastic energy, but if we have this, um, uh, this, actually this power mode that in the end will not uh, play that much of a role. Okay, so. In the end, finally, let me uh, collect everything together. So we just have that, uh, as I as I was showing here, the distance from the boundary con uh, from the, uh, of the boundary condition from uh, the first of the laminate uh, controls from below uh, the a um, scale of total energy, and therefore we have I mean a vertical bound. And here is maybe okay. It's maybe interesting also to see that when f is going, I mean. Is going towards, I mean, uh, the first order uh, lower bound, mm -hmm. meaning uh, going towards um, uh, this segment here, or maybe towards here, this uh, lower bound degenerates. So we don't really have the prefactor goes to zero, so we don't really have the lower bound. Okay. Uh, okay, so this, this was the lower bound. Some very quick comment about uh, the upper bound. The upper bound is just obtained. With a second order branching, so we just um, uh, we just um, laminate um, uh, we just laminate say in in one direction. This is the usual branching construction. So here you are close to be a laminate, but then uh, you want to attain uh, so here by compatibility by compatibility you can obtain boundary conditions uh, because of the rank one compatibility. But now on this other side, uh, I mean. You need to do a cutoff in order to obtain uh, the, the boundary condition. And the best way in the end to do a cutoff is going like sub similarly towards, um, towards the boundary. And um, so this is the first order branching construction. But in order to achieve um, a boundary condition in the second order laminate, we have to, uh, okay, it's not sufficient to, to laminate only once. We have to laminate. Uh, we have to laminate twice. If you want this gray picture here, it's just, I mean, um, it's just uh, this matrix here. And in this gray picture, in order to obtain this matrix, I have just to laminate my uh, other two stress free states. Okay, and then uh, you basically uh, compute uh, the elastic energy uh, of this construction. Uh, you compute the surface energy of this construction. You have to 
uh, these two uh, length scale floating around, you optimize and you get in the end uh, your epsilon one up. Okay, so uh, as I said, this is just a very quick comment. The first order, uh, the first order, so here I show you uh, epsilon one up, so the second order laminate uh, scaling. The first order scaling is simply uh, basically done by, by Konunia. Okay, so maybe this is uh, uh, this is maybe uh, another um, another interesting remark. Uh, if we arrive until the uh, the cubic to tetragonal, and this is basically um, I just wanted to remark the importance of uh, the fine boundary conditions because um, so if we take uh, basically the same um, the same uh, scaling. Uh, so uh, if we take if we take the same uh, sorry um, the same uh, model, but instead of a fine boundary condition, we put for instance periodic and then um, an average uh, constraint. Uh, then even if we start from um, an, an F, which is in the second uh, in the second uh, order laminate um, in the set. Uh, um, a laminate of, of second order, uh, we actually uh, we cannot reach um, the scaling bound of epsilon one up. So the second um, of the second order lamination. Okay, this is just to stress the fact that uh, the affine boundary condition is very important. Okay, and now here is just to okay, I show you the three well problem. And uh, so now, just a few comments on the n plus one well problem. If you want, this I already commented on. And uh, basically, the lower bound is obtained um, again uh, with the same Fourier argument. But now we have not only two uh, diagonal entries; we have n uh, diagonal entries, and each entry characterizes each other. And you can uh, play this con reduction game n minus one times. So instead of reducing, uh, instead of reducing the, the dimension of the cone only once, you reduce you reduce the dimension of the cone. Um, okay, in the end n times, and you uh, achieve this this scaling bound. Okay, whereas the upper bound uh, is still obtained with a branching construction of Hayekawa. Okay, so this is very uh, very quick also comment on the branching construction for higher orders and um, okay this is the main difficulty here is that if we think uh, if, if we think for instance in three dimensions we just have to um, to make a subsimilar refinement towards all the uh, all the um, so for instance if you think about 3d picture you have to uh, do a subsimilar refinement towards uh, two directions, I mean, which are uh, the boundary of, the, of your domain. And this you may give just by, you, you may obtain just by doing a branching construction and then using a rotation argument in order to uh, go uh, subsimilarly towards all, all the, all the um, uh, boundary of the domain. And okay. And uh, so, Basically, this would be the first order lamination, then inside these domains that you create in your first order lamination that are of this type, then you do as many orders of lamination that you want. Okay, so this is okay. This was the 3D, but of course it works perfectly also for higher dimensions. Okay, so maybe, uh, yeah, the very last thing uh, that I wanted to, I will go super quickly here. Um, okay, so now uh, we have shown <laughs> we have shown a little bit that uh, if we have this staircase um, stress-free sets that allows for um, um, higher order of lamination, then um, the, uh, the lamination, the order of lamination of the affine boundary condition determines your scale, and this is uh, in a very simple uh, no-frame invariant setting. Here we just um, 
uh, one little note that a similar effect uh, seems also to appear in uh, a more physical and physically relevant setting, which is the setting of geometrical linear rise elasticity, if you want. So now, uh, coming back to the nonlinear, so super quickly, coming back to the nonlinear case, we have a multi well, um, uh, multi -well stress free set. But now, if you assume that our deformation is, is very close to the identity, uh, you can write, I mean, um, the differential inclusion basically in this way. And what I wanted to say is that um, uh, now I'm concentrating instead of the deformation on this offset of the identity map of the deformation, which is usually called the, called the displacement. What you're interested in is no longer the gradient, but the symmetric gradient. And so you're no longer, no longer interested in the, the inclusion of the symmetric gradient um, into, um, uh, into some set K, so out of the gradient, but rather the inclusion of the symmetric gradient. So now you linearize your problem if you want. Instead of considering SON frame invariance, you consider skew frame invariance. And so basically, um, yeah. um, this corresponds to take not the full gradient, but just the symmetric part of the gradient. OK. And here, a very interesting set of matrices are the uh, following. Uh, uh, is the following three well problem. So where this, uh, now we call it strain, uh, E1, E2, E3. R of this four, and these, uh, I mean, are related to uh, cubic to tetragonal transformation. And uh, okay, now here, Euston state is represented by the zero matrix. And uh, okay, now the important uh, compatibility condition is no longer the rank one condition, but it's rather the symmetrized rank one condition. So that this, the difference between this, the web uh, must be a symmetrized. Uh, Rankin product, and uh, so here now is our set of um, of stress free. Um, this is our stress free set, and uh, for for this, if we take zero uh, osonate boundary condition, um, the osonate is uh, a laminate of second order. Okay. So again, we can ask. Uh, really the same question, and this is okay, let me do the disclaimer, this is still an ongoing project, but uh, now uh, uh, we consider the same um, the, the same signal perturb, I mean similar signal perturb energy, where instead of this, uh, this, the gradient, we put the symmetrized gradient, mm -hmm. and now this guy is just taking values in this cubic to the trigonal uh, set, and we put, uh, I mean, a fine boundary condition. Um, as well. Okay. And here uh, we, so this is a work in progress, but uh, uh, still this seems uh, what we, um, uh, this seems what we, we are obtaining that, okay, starting with this cubic to tetragonal, uh, also for, also in this case, we have this kind of dichotomy, so the, of, not, not dichotomy, but the, of, mm, this kind of effect that the orders, uh, the order of lamination of uh, the affine boundary condition uh, determines really this game. So if you take F, which is simply a first order laminate, so is obtained by just taking two uh, uh, two um, two matrices and laminate with with each other, then you obtain the Kronenmuller scaling. If instead you you take F, which is for instance the osonate, uh, so the zero matrix, and in order to obtain it, you have to laminate uh, you have to do a second order lamination to um, you obtain at least from the lower bound uh, a scaling uh, order epsilon and one up. So the same scaling we obtained, we obtained before. And here, very few comments um, is that um, this model has already been studied. I mean, the trigonal geometrically polarized has already been studied uh, by Capelli and Otto. Uh, but in the periodic uh, setting, so without um, uh, without a fine boundary condition, but with a periodic boundary condition, if you want, and a uh, mean value constraint. And uh, for for the periodic case, they don't obtain epsilon power one half, so you cannot really see a second order lamination, but they just obtain epsilon two. So this is just the same. 
fact that I tried to comment earlier uh, in our, uh, in our say, simplified uh, no frame invariance. Uh, and OK, uh, here, I mean, there's a lack of an upper bound uh, that is um, that is not typo somehow, but it's just for technical difficulties. And at the moment, we we just have not a clean epsilon one half um, upper bound, so not a matching one, but a slightly worse one. But we highly expect that this is also um, we would, that this is also the optimal uh, scaling bound. Okay, so I had uh, some lower bound ideas, but I guess maybe really pretending a bit too much from myself and also from you. Uh, so I really thank you for your attention.